you too. So when you're looking at uh, your airway medications, airflow disorders, what I want you to think is what opens the airway the quickest, okay? Um, this The question they're going to ask you on this one is a uh, person comes in with asthma or some type of breathing disorder. What is the first medicine that you give to open the airway? And that would be albuterol, okay? This one's not super hard. Um, but I do want to show you something that they may mention on the test. It says, be sure to recognize whether a beta-2 adrenergic agonist is short-acting or long. Okay, so right here, do you see it says beta-2? Now, you guys probably know this, and so if this is a repeat, I apologize, but beta-1 is you have one lung. So beta-1, when we attack beta-1, we're going straight to the lung. We're trying to take that medicine straight to the lung. Um, excuse me, when we do beta one, we're trying to take the medication straight to the heart because you have one heart. When you're doing beta two, you have two lungs. So we're trying to go to the lungs with this medication. And if you notice, so I would translate this beta two is the lungs and this adrenergic, this word adrenergic, all that means is you're going to send your patient into the sympathetic nervous system. So anytime you see the word adrenergic, think they're going to go into fight or flight. And an agonist is a helper. So this is, I'm going to translate this for you. And this is going to be important. Beta 2 is lungs, sympathetic helper. So what it means is it's going to send your lungs to the sympathetic nervous system. Um, it's going to do it really quick because albuterol is short acting, which means its response time is very quick. Okay. And it says, um, why does this matter? Okay. Because in red, what is what? your instructors wanted you to know and it says to immediately treat an asthma attack to open the airway because without an airway you have nothing right so keep in mind this is a short acting uh, it's usually for people who have asthma but patients with copd can take it or other lung disorders and it says inhaled short acting treatment for bronchospasm and asthma when you have asthma your bronchial tree will tend to swell shut and it will spasm a little bit. The bronchial tree inside the lungs is a muscle and um, it does, it moves, it constricts a little bit and then it dilates a little bit to help bring mucus up from the bottom of the lungs. So it does have an ability to move, but it can also bronchospasm, which just spasms. And usually with asthma, they'll have tightness, spasm, and they'll get mucus down inside their lung during an asthma attack. Now, here's the thing. Once we give albuterol, I want you to know what are the side effects of this medicine. A lot of patients don't like it because it's tachycardia. The heart will start to race because not only does it send the lungs to the sympathetic nervous system, but this medicine spills over into the rest of the body and causes your whole body to go to the sympathetic. So if you can't remember the signs and symptoms of it, think the whole body is really going to the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, client education. Um, we're going to watch for chest and jaw pain and arm pain because we could, you know, cause some serious things with the, with the lungs and with the heart. I mean, we're trying to open them up, but we could send them another direction. We got to check for pulse, uh, make sure we know their pulse is going to go faster on this and avoid caffeine because caffeine is going to speed you up. OK, um, look, tremors usually resolve with continued medicine use. So if you're going to give this to your patient, they go, whoa, I don't think I can take it. It's making my heart speed up and I just feel horrible. Over time, your body will get a little more used to it. It'll still send you to the sympathetic nervous system. When I mention MAOIs and tricyclic antidepressants increase the risk of tachycardia, we haven't got there yet with those meds, but just know there's certain antidepressants like these two right here that can increase the effects of albuterol. Now, when you see my notes and you see this, these little stars out to the side, I said to myself, that's 100% a test question. Okay, that's, that's what I was thinking. So advise the client to inhale the beta-2 agonist before inhaling the glutocorticoid. I was just uh, tutoring some LVNs yesterday about this, and I said, they're going to ask you, you have these medicines to give, which one would you give first? 
you always are going to give albuterol, the beta-2 agonist, before you give the steroid. Because if you don't open the airway first, the steroid's going to do nothing. Okay? Well, it'll do something, but it won't do it very quick. The beta-2 agonist promotes bronchodilation and enhances the absorption of glutocorticoids. That's important. So if they ask you on a test question, which one you give first? Albuterol. Okay? And then you can give the steroid. It takes a lot longer for steroids to work in the body. All right. So it says, uh, notify the provider if there's any increase in frequency and intensity of asthma exasperations. There's something that you're going to find out later that a patient with asthma can go into one asthma attack after another, after another, and it's called status asthmaticus. And that's probably why they're saying that here. So what I did on this, and y'all, I think you should really pay attention to these ATI questions I put here. But it says a new nurse, excuse me, a nurse is providing instructions to a client who has a new prescription for albuterol. So they've never really had it before. And they have bethlamiclazone. Now, if you've had this with me before, you know that zone, S-O-N-E, are the steroids. So we have a bethlamiclazone inhaler for the control of asthma. So we got albuterol and steroids. Which of the following instructions should the nurse include in the teaching? So I want you to look here and see if you see the answer that I just talked about. You can just say yes or no. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. If you said yes and you see B, administer the albuterol inhaler prior to using the bethlamiclazone inhaler, I think you're right. And we're going to go down and we're going to verify this. And it is correct. And it says, and read the rationale, when a client is prescribed an inhaled beta-2 agonist, albuterol, and inhaled glutocorticoid like bethlamiclazone, the client should take the beta-2 agonist first, promotes bronchodilation, and then enhances the absorption of steroids or glutocorticoid. Hmm. And you know what? When I When I highlighted through this, I didn't even read that question first because I've seen that question. They they do ask that. Um, a nurse is providing instructions to a client who has a new prescription for albuterol, PO, okay, by mouth. Which of the following instructions should the nurse include? Now, you can take albuterol as a pill. I think you can. It says PO here. So which of the following instructions should the nurse include? Um, let's read them together. You can take this med to an abort an acute uh, asthma attack. Tremors are an adverse effect of this med. Prolonged use of this med can cause hyperglycemia. This medication can slow skeletal growth rate. Hmm. Now, what do y'all think? Nobody's going to even know who you are, but what do you think? Anybody want to make a suggestion? Well, if you don't, let's go down here, and I'm going to teach you a little bit on this. Make sure you know that tremors can occur due to excessive stimulation. I think y'all probably already picked that up, right? Uh, when you're looking at what causes hyperglycemia, it's the steroids that cause high sugar, okay? And the steroid causes slow gro growth in the skeletal system. So um, inhaled albuterol is used to an abort an acute asthma episode. And I want to see here, it says, um, whoop, hang on. You can take this medicine to abort an acute asthma attack. Hmm. And it says, let's go back here. Inhaled is used to abort an acute asthma attack. Hmm. So uh, it is, but this is probably the most correct because of what the question is asking. And I'm sorry, guys, but I'm kind of tired. And so my mind is like, uh, when you take it, when you take it by an in nebula, or not a nebulizer, an inhaler, it goes straight to the lungs. Now, this is, is a little different. If you took it as a pill form, it has to go through the body and you're going to get way more tremors than you would if you had a, an inhaled version. Okay, and that's probably why. Okay, now, anybody who's had this with me just recently knows that Theo is powerful. Thelophilin, I call him Theo, okay? Theo, uh, you have to remember what Theo does. And if you look here, it says, be sure to address client education, okay? Uh, you got to educate your patient when they're taking this because this drug is powerful. This drug is, is uh, it's a bronchodilator, but it's a longer acting bronchodilator. It's not quick. 
And it says relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle resulting in bronchodilation. So it does open the airway. You can use it for asthma or COPD. You can do an oral pill or IV. Ooh, wait a minute. Look, route of administration route is oral or IV. Uh, look, mild toxicity. This drug can become toxic. And so I want you to remember Theo can make you toxic. Okay. And here's the range. The therapeutic range that's in the bloodstream when you take this should be between five and 15. Do you see my little stars out there? That means I thought this is 100% a test question. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but that's what I thought. Levels at less than 20, uh, it's unlikely to occur at less than 20. So over 20, you're probably going to be toxic, okay, on this drug. Activated charcoal is used to decrease the absorption. Lidocaine is used to treat dysrhythmias. And diazepam is used to control seizures. So if you do become toxic... You're going to have some, obviously, uh, some poisoning going on because toxicity is too much medicine in the blood. Lidocaine, I don't, I know that you're thinking, do they drink lidocaine? What do they do? Well, lidocaine can be injected into the heart for dysrhythmia. And then diazepam is used to control seizures, which is going to calm the central nervous system down. So what do we got to do when we're giving Theo? You got to monitor the blood levels needed report nausea, diarrhea, and restlessness, which are signs of toxicity. Guys, you got to know that. This whole little section, you got to know, okay? Um, because this is sending the patient to the sympathetic nervous system, what happens, and albuterol does the same thing too, is it constricts the vessels in the extremities and it opens the airway. So because it constricts the vessels out in the extremities, this patient may have some hypertension along with this drug, okay? If they give you a question about caffeine, caffeine increases central nervous system and cardiac effects. It can speed you up, right? So you wouldn't want to give caffeine with something that can already speed you up. Avoid, avoid caffeine beverages like coffee, caffeinated sodas, and energy drinks, okay? Just make sure you know. Now, there's other meds that can increase the thalophylline levels. Um, you haven't gotten them yet, but some of these, uh, like this is a antibiotic and this is also a different kind of antibiotic. Uh, just know, I, I don't know that I would study that, but I would just know that there are antibiotics that can increase it. Um, but what if the patient calls you on the test and says, hey, I forgot to take my dose of the Laughlin. Um, Can I take another dose or what should I do? If a dose is missed, the following dose should not be doubled. We don't want to, we don't want to send any more medicine into their system. So the big thing, see, we're keeping it as simple as possible. Okay. So the big thing with Theo, if we, and I'm going to shut my recorder off here in a minute, and I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. Is that you can give it oral or IV. It's for the same thing. It does bronchodilate, but this is the big thing here. You got to know what you're looking at. Okay. So let's go down. Now there's another, I wish I would have kind of put abitropium under albuterol because I've seen where albuterol is a fast acting and abitropium is a longer acting drug. It just takes a little bit longer for it to work, but it is also a bronchodilator, okay? So if you think about it, abitropium, uh, they call it abitropium bromide uh, in the real world. And then there's something here, it's called triotropium. Now, whether they're going to add, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of just put this here and I'm going to change this color to blue or something, just so y'all will be aware. Uh, triotropium is, a, is the same thing as abitropium, except it's more for COPD patients and it comes in a pill, like a capsule. You don't swallow the capsule, okay? You put it in this little uh, inhaler. It's It's kind of a round inhaler and it's got a little thing where you put the pill in it and then you shut it and it pops the capsule and it's powder now. And then the patient inhales the powder. That is what triotropium is. Okay. Abitropium is more of, of just a regular inhaler. So this results in bronchodilation. As long as you remember, then you're going to be good. Uh, it also really works better for a patient with COPD to help with bronchospasms. 
And it says it's approved. Abitropium is FDA approved for only for bronchospasm associated with COPD. So this drug was approved by the FDA for COPD. But guess what? They now use it for asthma. Not super common. I mean, you'll see it. It is. But they use it for both things. The route of administration of this drug is inhaled. So you're going to inhale it in. And just remember, it's going to cause you to have dry mouth, maybe some hoarseness in your throat. Uh, what are you going to do to treat it? You're going to educate the patient. If they say, hey, this, this is drying my throat up, then you say take slips of, sips of fluid and suck on sugar-free candy to control the dryness in your mouth, okay? Um, these neither one are bad. I mean, pregnancy category B, pregnancy category C. I don't think you're going to get a pregnancy question on this one. But it says... This drug is contraindicated in clients who have an allergy to peanuts because their medication is contains soy, lithocin, which is like a peanut type of a derivative. So do you see the little stars out there? I think if you're going to write five words about ibotropium, I would say, hey, don't give it to somebody who has a peanut allergy. Uh, don't give it to somebody who has narrow angle glaucoma. Now, I know some of you were on here with me the other day, and when you have glaucoma, your eyes are already in the sympathetic nervous system. They're huge. I don't know if any of you have seen a person with glaucoma, but their pupils are huge. They're dilated. I remember the first time I ever saw somebody with glaucoma, I was went in, I didn't know they had it, and I was like looking at their face, assessing them, and then I went, hmm. I looked at their eyes and I thought, oh my gosh, and I said, do you have glaucoma? And they said, yes because their pupils are so large. Well, when pupils are large, they're under pressure, okay? That their pupils are actually in the sympathetic nervous system. So if we gave them a drug that's gonna send them to the sympathetic nervous system, that's gonna make their pupils dilate even more, put them under pressure and possibly make them blind, okay? So I'm gonna tell you, I think that could be a test question. Do not give this to someone who has narrow angle glaucoma because you're going to put their eyes under more pressure. Not really sure why benign prostate hyperplasia. I've never seen a test question on that one, but I've seen one on uh, narrow angle glaucoma. Okay, so you're the nurse now. You're going to teach the patient how to administer this, okay? Uh, adult dosage is two puffs. Instruct the client to wait the length of time directed between puffs. And that's all it said in the ATI. It's usually about five minutes or so. It could be two minutes, depending on. I don't think they're going to ask that. But know that it's probably about two puffs. And then after, you're going to rinse the mouth out to decrease all the medication that just went in your mouth and your throat. Because we really want it in the lungs, right? Now, this is an important fact, okay? If two inhaled meds are prescribed, wait at least five minutes between each med. If they're two different kinds, you'll give one, wait about five minutes, give the other. Um, do you remember what I said about triotropium capsules? An inhalation device is used for administration of the capsule. <laughs> Don't swallow it. I think they're going to ask that, even though that's not on your list. So be aware of triotropium and just be aware of what it's going to do. So, okay, let me do something real quick. I am going to pause this or not, but here we go. Why do you give steroids? To prevent inflammation and suppress airway mucus. That's why a steroid has the unique ability to reduce inflammation in the body. Our body makes steroids every day. Uh, if it didn't, we might be like humongous people full of inflammation. So it's important that we have steroids but it, it prevents inflammation. One of the things I want you to know is anywhere in the body that you have inflammation, there's white blood cells bringing the inflammation. So when you have a lung disorder, something's wrong in the lung, there's gonna be inflammation there because the white blood cells are coming in trying to fix what's wrong. They just try to fix, that's all they know. They don't really have a brain like, oh, we shouldn't go there because we could cause too much trouble. So they bring in the inflammation and they suppress airway mucus production and, um, and they also you know, cause the bronchial tree to constrict. So when we give steroids, we're reducing all of that. That's what we're doing. We're reducing inflammation. 
And it doesn't matter what you give steroids for. That's to reduce inflammation. This is going to reduce airway edema. Okay. So even though we bronchodilated with those other guys and we got those lungs wide open, we're going to have a reduction of edema, which is caused by the white blood cells. So glutocorticoids do not provide immediate effects. I starred that like five times. Did you see that? You got to know that glutocorticoids don't give immediate effects. That's why you give albuterol first and then you give the steroid. Uh, two is because it's going to take a while for these to work. Um, let's look down here. <clears throat> now, y'all remember when I said there's something that is like one asthma attack after another asthma attack? That's called status asthmaticus, and it's all highlighted in yellow. Letitia, when you get my notes, you'll see this is all highlighted. Um, inhaled agents are used for long-term prophylaxis of asthma. So usually... A patient has, I don't know if you've ever seen an Advair disc. That's what comes to mind. It has steroid in it and the patient will inhale it. It's kind of like comes in a purple little disc and you click the button and then you put it and suck it in and it's the little powder inside there. No pill, but just the powder is in there. Um, those are inhaled steroids to some degree. Uh, patients can use them. Now, this is an interesting fact, and I don't know if they'll bring this up on your exam, but I put some stars out beside it. When a mom is going to deliver a baby and the baby is not ready to come, let's just say they're too early, they're, they're premature. What they'll do is they'll put mom on steroids for about 24 hours, I think, hope to keep the baby in there a little bit longer. And what those steroids will do is help mature the baby's lungs. So when they're born, they won't have as many issues. So it says promotes lung maturity and decrease respiratory distress in the fetus at risk for preterm birth. They may ask that. Uh, if it's not in this class, it will be an OB, okay? So one thing about steroids, so there's a lot to hear with steroids, so bear with me here. It can cause candidatus inside the mouth. So it can cause oral thrush. Um, steroids can cause yeast infections, they can cause thrush, but candidatus is oral thrush, right? And it's a yeast infection in the mouth. So what would you do? And this I did star. Look, make sure they rinse their mouth or gargle with water after they use it. Try to get it out of their mouth, rinse their mouth out, right? Candidatus with nystatin, oral suspension uh, is what you treat it with. Now, I think I mentioned this the other night. If the patient does get a little candidatus or yeast in the mouth, how do you treat it? Well, you give nystatin. Nystatin comes in a little cup. It almost looks like a dipping sauce <laughs> that you would get with your chicken, a little round one, and it and you open it up. You pull that like full tab off, and it's liquid, and you put it in your mouth, and you swish it around and gargle with it. But the question is, do you swish and swallow, or do you swish and spit? Does anybody know? You spit. You spit it out. No, you don't no. spit it out. Not this one. You swallow it. Because if they have candidatus in their throat, then it's probably down. I mean, in their mouth, it's probably down their throat. So with Nystatin, oral solution, you swish and swallow. That was, mm -hmm. that's, that's a question. You would normally think you would spit. And normally you would spit some out, but on this one, you don't. Now, here's what I was talking about earlier. With prednisone, if you use it for 10 days or more, it can result in the suppression of the adrenal gland, which I told you earlier. Your own steroids go on vacation and it takes them about seven days to recognize, oh, we need to start working again. So if you stop your steroids and then your other steroids, your body steroids are on vacation, you got like several days here with no steroid, you're going to have a serious issue. So it says a decrease in the ability of the adrenal cortex to produce glutocorticoids. So we need to make sure that um, we teach the patient we're going to wean off. You can't just stop steroids if you've taken them for longer than 10 days, okay? You're going to have to have some wean. You're going to wean off. They have something called a methyl dose pack that is like a, it's like a foil sleeve and it's got pills in it. And the first line has like seven and then the next line has six, and then five, then four, then three, then two, then one. And they 
put them on a methyl dose pack after they're done with their steroids to wean them off. Okay. One other, now these are all going to be important. So anytime throughout this whole course, when you see steroid, you need to think we got to wean them off of the steroid when they're on there longer than 10 days. We have to monitor blood glucose levels because steroids increase blood sugar. So if you have a patient who's diabetic, would you want to know, in fact, if you're a diabetic, you probably don't even want a steroid unless it's an emergency because it can make your sugars go high. But make sure you know it's going to make sugars go high. And you know one other thing? It's probably on here, but I don't see it right away, but I'm going to say it. Steroids make your potassium go low. Okay? Remember that. Blood sugar goes high, potassium goes low. So we're going to have to taper the dose. Another serious effect of, potass uh, of steroids is bone loss. Uh, it does something to the bones where it causes the calcium to leave the bone. And so uh, that's a big issue. If you already have bone loss, you probably don't want a bunch of steroids. Um, how do we get the calcium back in the bone? How do we do that? I want you to see this green highlighted. Perform weight-bearing exercise. Now, they can ask you a question about exercise. And if you've had steroids, how do you, you know, what do you do? You want weight-bearing exercise because that's going to push the calcium back into the bone. Not swimming, not running, not hockey, but lifting weights, weight-bearing exercise, okay? You're going to try to consume a diet with calcium and vitamin D. And everybody knows you should take calcium, right? But calcium doesn't work if you don't open the door for it to enter. And vitamin D opens the door to let calcium in. So when you take calcium, you really should have vitamin D, okay? If you look here, we if we get too much, um, if our sugars go too high, obviously we'll have hyperglycemia, but then we can start peeing sugar, glycosuria, okay? Uh, if you have diabetes, you definitely need to have your glucose monitored. And you may have to adjust your insulin. You may have to give them a little more insulin to cover their sugars. Here's a thing. And I know I said this uh, to those of you who have seen, heard this before. And I hope this, this double time is, is really going to pay off for you. But um, peptic ulcer disease. Now, there's a couple meds out there that can affect the GI lining. And one of them is aspirin, which you know. And the other one is a steroid. I'll tell you an example. So this lady came into the ER. She was having really bad abdominal pain. Um, she ended up having to go on a ventilator and they decided to go down with the scope and EGD and look in her stomach, see what's going on. So they put the scope down. The doctor didn't see anything. And he turned the camera to come back out. And when he turned the camera upward, he saw a huge hole in the top of her stomach and you could see the heart pumping. Do you know what she took together? She took aspirin and steroids together and it eroded her stomach. So be aware that these can cause a peptic ulcer, which is a GI bleed, right? It can actually cause a hole in the stomach and you would have missed her with food or meals because you're gonna to try to protect the stomach. Any food that's hard on the stomach, give them some food, put it in their stomach before they take it. Avoid NSAIDs. NSAIDs have a tiny bit of aspirin in them. NSAIDs have to be held before surgery because they have aspirin in them. So an NSAID plus a corticosteroid, not a good idea, right? Report black tarry stools, check stool for occult blood. And one other thing, there's a lot with steroids. Steroids are going to lower the immune system. Now I'm talking, I'm not talking if you have to be on steroids for three to five days and then get off of them. That's not too bad. But if somebody has to be on long-term steroids, like an asthmatic or COPD or something like that, then their chance of getting an infection is high. Uh, it lowers the immunity in the body, okay? So if on a test question, and I should star this, I should triple star this here. In fact, I might, because I'll be sending it out to you guys. But um, make sure you know if you see a test question and the patient's on a steroid, and then they say all of a sudden they have a sore throat, you're thinking they have a bad infection because they don't have an immune, immune system because steroids lower immunity. So avoid large crowds and then obviously practice hand hygiene. Here's your hypokalemia. Remember I said it lowers potassium. And here's a couple more little things, okay? 
if you've never taken a steroid, bless you. But if you have taken a steroid, you will know that after you're on a steroid for like one or two days, you feel like you could eat everything in your refrigerator. It increases the appetite so much, but it causes the patient to gain weight, but it's a little different kind of weight. It's called steroid weight. And steroids, if you're on a steroid, let's just say you have to be on a steroid for months and months and months, okay? Sometimes what it will do is when you gain weight, that fat will redistribute and you'll get like a buffalo hump at the back of your neck where the fat has pushed up against the back of the neck. Um, so it does change the shape of the body, okay? So be aware of that. And then it is a pregnancy category D. Oh, I think I might know what they might ask you here, okay? Remember we said, watch for infection because it lowers immunity. Now, here is probably the question. If the patient needs to have a live virus vaccine, would you give it? I hope so. I hope, no, right? No, because their immune system is low. And if you give them a live virus, it could really hurt them. Um, and it says those who have systemic fungal infections. Um, so don't give... Um, if your patient's on a steroid, don't give it to somebody who has a fungal infection or a live virus, okay? Uh, when we talk about bone loss, yes? I'm so sorry, Coach Pam. Does this also apply to topical steroids or is it only with oh. the... Oh, I like that. So did you hear what Le Leticia said? She said, does it apply to topical steroids? And I'm going to mention that because she said it. There was one time, and I'm going to tell you, anything that is put on the skin goes into the body, okay? Uh, does it work quite the same? Not really, but you can have the same effects. And there was one time in a pediatric unit, we I went in and somebody else had taken care of this little baby, and they had smothered the baby. The baby had a rash, but they literally put steroid cream all over that baby. And I was like, why? Because whatever steroid is on the skin is going to go into that little baby's body and that baby is going to have some serious side effects from all that steroid. So that's a good question. Yes, topical steroids, you still have to be careful. Can they lower potassium? Yes. Can they raise blood sugar? Yes. Um, will they give you the GI effect? Probably not because it's not straight in the stomach, but it could. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, let's look here down at some questions now. Okay. So, uh, an ATI question, a nurse is teaching a client who has a new prescription for Bethlemeclazone. We said that's an oral steroid. Which of the following instructions should the nurse include? And if you see it, it says, rinse your mouth out after each use of this medication. It says, limit your fluid intake while taking this med. No. Increase your intake of vitamin B12. No. You can take the medicine as needed. No, I'm going to say rinse your mouth out because it's an oral steroid and you want to get rid of it in the mouth. Brush your, I always used to tell patients, put some water in your mouth, brush your teeth without toothpaste, and then just spit it out. Okay. Um, a nurse is teaching a client who has a prescription for long-term oral prednisone for a treatment of chronic asthma. The nurse should instruct the client to monitor for which of the following manifestations as an adverse effect of this medication. Now, I put it out here, I, I actually put out to the answer Cushing's weight gain. When you have long-term steroids, you better expect that the patient's going to have weight gain, and it's called Cushing syndrome, okay? That's why I put that out to the side. Um, so be aware of that. And then you can go down to the rationale, and it says weight gain and fluid retention are adverse effects of oral prednisone due to the effect of sodium and water retention. So they tend to hold uh, sodium and water. Okay, so the last one, I think this is the last one. Let me go down here and see. We're gonna, okay. The last one on this list is not a steroid. Okay, this one is not a steroid. This is called monolucast. And if you've heard of the drug named Singular for asthma, this is it, okay? This is a daily medication. This is not a rescuing medication. And I think they're gonna probably ask you, uh, they might say, which one would you get first? Albuterol, glutocorticoid, monolucast. You got to know what, what they do, okay? This drug, it's a leukotriene modifier. 
What does that mean? That means a leukotrains or leukocytes come in. Remember, I told you at first, white blood cells come in and try to repair, but they tend to cause more inflammation and cause more trouble. So let's just say a pharmacist sat around and said, you know what, with asthma, there's so much white blood cells coming in, causing so much inflammation. What if we hold the white blood cells back? What if we make a leukotrain modifier? And they were like, oh yeah, that's, that works good. So that's why they made this. And it said leukotrain modifiers suppress the effects of leukotrains, thereby reducing inflammation, bronchoconstriction, airway edema, and mucus production. Okay. So that's what this is. It's not a steroid. Monoleucast is used in children as young as 12 months of age. Hmm. Now let's look down here. Depression and suicidal ideation. I started that. I would not have guessed that monoleucast could cause depression or maybe even make someone commit suicide. I, I wouldn't have guessed that. So I started that. I don't know if that's something they'll ask, but I started. it. Um, it is hard on the liver. So a lot of times they ask you what organ is it hard on and you want to obtain your baseline liver function test. Uh, if they if they throw the liver labs on there, I'm going to tell you what they are. AST and ALT. If they say get uh, AST and ALT, those are the liver labs. Okay, so we've got to know we're going to check the liver labs. All right, we're going to monitor for liver damage. Now, why does it damage the liver? I don't know but it probably works uh, a little bit. Uh, here's the thing. Why do some meds damage the liver? Depends probably on a, a couple of factors. Because this medication is oral, it's got to pass through the stomach, through the liver, and then go through the bloodstream and make it to where it's supposed to go back in the lungs, right? Or wherever it's supposed to hold back the white blood cells. But here's the thing. You think it's just going to hold white blood cells back in the lungs? No. It's going to hold white blood cells back in the whole body. And so this poor patient, even though it's helping with their asthma, um, they're not going to have an immune system very, very good because the white blood cells are being held back. And so you really want to know um, here, at, well, I would watch for a risk of infection with this one also. It does. I don't have that highlighted, but I'm sure somewhere it says that. Uh, down there. There's a lot that it says. Here's the one last thing about it. Monoleucast once daily at bedtime for exercise induced bronchospasm. Take two hours before exercise. If, if they're going to exercise, they can do that. If taking daily monoleucast, do not take an additional dose for exercise induced bronchospasms. So what it's saying is if you take it daily, don't, don't double up your dose. Okay. You should take it daily at bedtime. But if you're going to go exercise and you always get asthma during exercise, you can take it that way. I think it's going to, they're going to ask you to take it at bedtime. So let's stop here. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to pause it. And I'm going to try to put this. Um, so we've got upper respiratory disorders now. And um, the first one we have is coding. Huh? Why is coding under upper respiratory disorders? Anybody have an idea? It's a cough suppressant. Yeah. You know, a long time ago, when I was young, they used to put codeine in the cough medicine. That's That was it. You'd be like, ooh, and then you'd go to sleep and you didn't feel bad anymore. So, uh, but what it is, is, is they know that an opioid, which is really a serious drug, right, is also an antitussive for cough. So if you see the word antitussive, that means cough, all right? Now, here's the question that they like to ask. If you have coding ordered for pain, okay, and you know your patient's got a cough and you're like, ooh, that's a bad cough. Uh, you got coding ordered. Can I go get that coding and give it to the patient for a cough? No. It has to be ordered for what it's given for, okay? You may go, wow, you got coding and, and that's going to help with a cough. I want to go give it to you. No. It's, you cannot do that. If you give it for what it's ordered for. So you'd have to get another order from the doctor. Okay. Um, it suppresses the cough, but it says through its action on the central nervous system to increase the cough threshold. So it actually works in the central nervous system, like the brain and the spinal cord. That's kind of weird. That's why opioids are very addictive. 
Codeine is used for a chronic non-productive cough to decrease the frequency and then the intensity of it. So that's one of the things that why it's on here. But y'all remember studying opioids and there's something you got to watch when you give an opioid. Do y'all remember what it is? Respiratory depression. Do not forget that. That will be with you forever and a day. So we've got to watch respirations. If they're less than 12, that's pretty serious. But if they're less than eight, they're having respiratory depression. Okay, let's see what it says here. Observe for manifestations of respiratory depression, respirations less than 12. So go with that number. Stimulate the client to breathe if respiratory depression occurs. Um, it can be necessary to stop the medication and administer what? What do you administer for an opioid overdose? Um, naloxone. That's right. Okay. I want to tell y'all something about naloxone, and I don't know if they're going to test you on this right this moment. But here's the deal. You may have already had it tested on. Um, opioids last longer in the body than the actual reversal drug. So if you give an opio if you have an opioid overdose, you may give naloxone, and then 90 minutes later, your patient's back in respiratory depression because the opioid lasts longer than the reversal. So you may have to administer naloxone like two or three times during during the the time that they're on the opioid so just be aware it's not one and done it's one maybe two maybe three times okay it's going to make the patient sleepy don't drive while you're taking it especially cough syrup it's going to do the same thing an opioid does cause constipation and so you want to increase fluids and fiber in the body uh, look down here this is a schedule two class of the controlled substance act Codeine that's mixed with an other antitussive is actually considered a schedule five, which is the highest. I think schedule five is the highest you can go. Okay. So if it's mixed with another kind of thing, like they used to give us when we were kids, I'm surprised we ended up, ended up living or being okay. We probably all had respiratory depression and went to sleep and didn't realize we were probably near death, but now we do. Now we do. So don't do any activity that requires alertness. So this is pretty much the same thing that you knew for opioids, um, but just remember the little facts about it, okay? Now there's something called dextromethorphan, and dextromethorphan is an antitussive, but it is not an opioid. It says a non-opioid, okay? Um, what is dephenhydramine? Dephenhydramine. Tell me what that is. These are other types oh, of what? Um, it's Benadryl. It's Benadryl, right? So dextromethorphan and dephenhydramine are antitussives. Did you know Benadryl will help with cough? Benadryl has some really pretty interesting qualities. Benadryl, if you're at school and you're feeling like you're going to throw up and you don't have anything, nothing for nausea, you can go get a Benadryl and it will calm your nausea. Okay, so different hydramine there. Uh, dextromethorphan suppresses cough through its action on the central nervous system. So it still works in the central nervous system. And look at here. There are some potential abuse for this medicine because it causes euphoria. It probably like, woo, I feel better now, right? And so people are like, hey, I need that again. That made me feel really good. Even though it's a non-opioid, it can still be abused. Um, uh, look. Interactions can cause a high fever when used within two weeks of an MAOI antidepressant. I'm just going to tell you, MAOI antidepressants, we haven't got there yet, but they're old. They're the last resort antidepressant because uh, the way they work and the, you, the patient has to watch what they eat and they interact with everything. Okay. So if you see an MAOI antidepressant, probably say, nope, shouldn't have mixed that with it. Um, some formula or some formulations contain alcohol or sugar uh, available in capsule lozenges for clients older than 12 liquids and syrups. So you can go to the store and I bet you, you can go, you know, I know you, y'all don't have any time to go lounge at CVS, but you could go over into the cough medicine section and look and see which cough medicines have dextromethorphan in it. Uh, I bet you'll find the ones that do, but they might be high, might be behind the counter with a pharmacist. Um, 
sometimes these medications, uh, they're over the counter and you don't have to have a doctor's prescription, but you might have to go up to the pharmacy and say, do you have any of this? Like, I don't know, some pseudoephedrine is like Advil, Clonid, Sinus and stuff, but you may have to buy these behind the counter. Now there, here's guafonacin. I like saying that name, guafonacin. It just sounds really um, interesting. But if you think of it, it starts with a G, think gunk, like a lot of gunk. It's going to help you expectrate the gunk, get it out of your uh, chest, right? So guafonacin is robitussin. That's really what it is. It is, is an expectorant and it has a mucolytic pro property, which means it's going to help. Okay, so this is how it works. Remember I told you earlier that the bronchial tree can constrict and dilate, right? So this is going to help with some of uh, the loosening of the mucus in the alveoli and help constrict a little bit to bring the mucus up to where we can cough it out. Uh, it says you should take this medicine with a full glass of water, and I five-starred that. Uh, if you're going to give something to someone to bring mucus out of their lungs, you need fluid to bring it up with it, okay? So you need a full glass of water. Keep the patient hydrated. That's a test question. Um, remember, it promotes increased cough production by increasing thinning mucus secretion. So it's really going to thin the mucus out, but it can't do it without fluids. So you're going to make sure this patient has fluids. Uh, let's look, it could cause some GI upset, but I don't think that's serious. Guafonacin or caution should be taken regarding clients who have asthma because guafonacin can cause a bronchospasm. Mm. Uh, most of the time when you go over the counter, you don't even know that, but just know, uh, mucolytic could probably, it's a expectorant could do that. This medication is available in tablets, which should not be crushed and capsules, which can be opened to sprinkle on foods. Huh? Did you know that? You can take it in a pill form, but you can't crush the pill. And then you can take it in a capsule form, but you have to sprinkle it on foods to take it. Hmm, I didn't know that. Report a cough lasting longer than one week to the provider. Uh, the reason why you wouldn't want to have a long lasting cough is this. Um, my husband used to work um, and he worked with this guy and this guy had a cough. He thought he had allergies for like a year. Finally, he was got this cough so bad. He said, you know what? I got to go to the doctor and get something for my allergies. Came out of the doctor with stage four lung cancer. That continuous cough, cough, cough has to be checked. And so that's why it's saying report when lasting longer than a week. Make sure you go get checked. Take doses of guafonacin with a full glass of water. That's a repeat. Cough is more productive and mucus is easier to expectorate, probably with fluids. And then chest dis uh, congestion is decreased. Okay, so we've got guafonacin. You got to know what that is and you got to know how it works. Now, you guys know this one from the last test, probably, or the first. I don't know wh when you had this, but acetylcysteine. You're used to seeing it for what kind of overdose? Do you remember what acetylcysteine is for? Is that like Tylenol? Yes, oh. yes, Tylenol. Both of y'all are right. This is a, for Tylenol overdose. Uh, believe it or not, but it was first made for an asthma medicine. And it is not an asthma medicine, a mucolytic to bring mucus out of the lungs, okay? And um, it says mucolytics thin and enhance the flow of secretions in the respiratory passage. So kind of expectorants and mucolytics kind of work similar, but um, this one would be really helpful for a patient who has cystic fibrosis. If your patient has cystic fibrosis, they overproduce mucus in their lungs, like really thick, gunky mucus, and they can't get it up. It's just, it becomes like cement. And some of these patients will have to wear like a, it looks like a life jacket that vibrates and helps bring up the mucus because they have trouble with that. But acetylcysteine works really good for this, okay? But it is also an antidote for acetaminophen um, poisoning. Um, I'm going to skip that part. Now, here's something. Acetylcysteine is administered by inhalation to liquefy nasal and bronchial secretion. So you can, you can inhale it or you can drink it. <laughs> and if you drink it, it smells like rotten eggs, believe it or not. It says the medication is administered orally or IV for acetaminophen toxicity. I never forget. I was in a clinic one time and there was a patient who came in and he, tried to kill himself on Tylenol. And so, of course, they give him acetylcysteine and he's like, this is horrible. 
it's it's horrible it tastes horrible you know but you know what that's what you get uh when you try to kill yourself with acetaminophen so hopefully that'll help you remember remember it it does have a rotten egg smell to it so it has a couple uses all right now i never can say this word phenylnephrine uh, i say however you want phenylnephrine uh the other name of phenylnephrine a uh, friend is uh afrin like an afrin no spray Okay, if you have ever used an Afrin nose spray, you have taken this drug and it is a decongestant. Okay, so look what it says here. It says a sympathetic decongestant stimulate the alpha one adrenergic receptors, causing reduction in inflammation of the nasal membranes. Okay, now let me explain this. We talked about beta one, one heart, beta two, two lungs, but this says alpha one. I have to explain it here. If you have alpha one or alpha two, they're talking about vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Alpha one constricts the vessels. So if we sniff it up the nose, we constrict the vessels in the nose and open the airway, okay? But guess where else? If you're sniffing up the nose and it's constricting the vessels in the nose, you're also constricting the vessels in the whole body because it's gonna spill over there. And so uh, be aware, <laughs> That you could have hypertension from taking nose spray because you're going to tighten the vessels, okay? It will relieve nasal stuffiness. It's fantastic, but here's the question. If you take this uh, Afrin, I'm going to call it Afrin, but y'all know phenylephrine. If you take that for longer than three days in a row, you're going to actually get more stuffy than less stuffy. It's called rebound congestion or rebound nasal congestion. Um guess what? You may have to taper it down and discontinue the medicine one nostril at a time. Hmm. Do you see how I start this here? I think that's important. It says for short-term therapy, no more than three to five days. If you use this nose spray for more than five days, you might have rebound nasal congestion. Um, I'll tell you, my husband, he's a nasal spray fanatic. He been, he'll use it. And I said, you can't use that for more than three to five days. It's going to make you worse. Um, but he doesn't care. So just know uh, it's not going to kill you, but it can cause rebound nasal congestion. And I think that's a test question. Okay. Do you see hypertension here? I start that because it's going to constrict the vessels in the nose, but it's also going to constrict the vessels in the body. And then down here, I also put closed ankle glaucoma. If you remember from the first, I said, when you're in the sympathetic nervous system, your pupils are dilated, they're under pressure. So when we take this medicine, we're sending the patient to the sympathetic nervous system. Then if they have closed angle glaucoma, their eyes are already under pressure. We could cause somebody to go blind. So this is another one that you got to be careful with uh, glaucoma. Now you're going to teach your patient. When administering nasal drops, instruct clients to be in the lateral low head low position to increase the desired effect and to prevent swallowing the medication i th i don't know if i told you all this or not but i was kind of stupid one time i took some nose spray and i tilted my head back and i squirted the bottle and almost the whole bottle went down my throat of course i called poison control because i thought oh my gosh it can't be good to have swallowed this much i'm probably gonna have vasoconstriction uh and die so obviously i didn't die I'm here again, but you got to know that you want to put your head down lower and then sniff it in. Not all the way low, but don't tilt your head back, okay? Uh, it says drops are preferred for children because they can be administered precisely and toxicity can be prevented. When nasal spray preps are prescribed, teach clients regarding their proper use. Pseudephedrine and ep uh, ephedrine can produce effects similar to amphetamines and are easily converted into amphetamines. So we got to be... I don't, I don't really think um, that's going to be important. What I do think is how you're going to administer it um, and then rebound nasal congestion. I'm pretty sure you're going to see rebound nasal congestion. Um, should you give, should a, a person who already has hypertension, let me ask you this, should they take a lot of no, no spray? If they, no, they shouldn't because it's going to cause more hypertension. Okay. Now let's go down here and we've got diphenhydramine and we got loratadine yay we're almost to the end of these lovely drugs now 
let's think about this for a second. Everybody knows dethenhydramine is Benadryl. It's been around a long time. It has a lot of good uses, but somewhere in the future, when you get toward the end of this program, you'll realize that uh, dethenhydramine reduces histamine in the body, which is good because too much histamine can cause vasodilation in the body, which is a whole nother story. So what we need to do is uh, we've got a first generation and a second generation. So a long time ago, this was made, I call it the first generation drugs where they made them a long time ago, but they didn't know how to take the sleepiness out of them. And so these first generation drugs make the patient ex pretty sleepy. If you've ever taken Benadryl, you know you can't really concentrate. The second generation they invented to not make you sleepy because think about it like this, probably people were getting an allergy and then they were calling nursing school saying, I just had to take a Benadryl and I can't stay awake in class so I can't come, right? So whoever probably called the pharmacy people and said, hey, make one that doesn't cause sleepiness so we can have our students at school. And so loratadine, cetrazine, um, those are the second generation. Those are Claritin and uh, Zyrtec. Those are the newer ones that don't make you as sleepy. Do the same thing, but without the sleepy effects. Um, ooh, okay, look, it says, uh, um, so they block histamine one which results in the blocking of histamine in the small blood vessels, capillaries, and nerves during an allergic reaction, okay? Um, let me see. I'm going to see if there's one thing I want to tell you. Hold on. Let me go down here real quick and see. I know that's a long ways down, huh? Okay, so we're almost done. Bear with me, okay? So one thing that you need to know is you can take um, Benadryl, for seasickness, for motion sickness, it will also help because it will dry the patient up, okay? Take it for allergies. Um, we can, uh, if you're taking Benadryl, the first generation, you would want to quit operating heavy machinery. You don't want to be driving around. Um, you wouldn't want to take alcohol or any other CNS depressant, okay? And it's going to dry you up. It can cause constipation. Those are some of the side effects. Uh, Benadryl is considered an anticholinergic which draws you up. All right. More common with first generation agents. If this is what they're going to say to you, you're going to teach the patient what to do if they get really dry, take sips of water, suck on sugarless candy and maintain two to three liters of water each day from food and beverages. So you're going to teach the patient what to do if they get dry. Okay. Uh, their chances of dry mouth and urinary retention. Now you don't really think about urinary retention. If it's going to dry you up, are you going to pee that much? No, because you're going to dry up. So it could cause you to hold in your urine a little more. Um, and it also can affect the pupils because um, this is what's happening when we are actually in the sympathetic nervous system. So these are going to send us there. Um, and Mr. Activated Charcoal and Cathartic to Decrease Absorption of Antihistamine. So I guess what they mean here is if somebody tries to overdose, we're going to give them activated, sorry, I have that gets activated charcoal. Okay, now let's do some practice questions and we will be done. Okay, I'm going to stop here.